Um, so yesterday I, I tried to talk about just a couple, I mean, some of the techniques we have in the subject to do anything. Uh, the first was I talked a little bit about if I have a torus action on X, and, you know, the, you know, let's say if X is toric, I have a big three-dimensional torus acting on X, and I work everywhere now with equivariant cohomology. Then I can use some localization techniques to get some kind of, you know, some kind of combinatorially kind of insane expression for uh, for the invariance that we're interested in. But it's something that, for instance, is completely codable, so it allows you to actually do some kinds of checks and things like that. Um, and it also gives a kind of an in-principle way of understanding anything you want, but it's just hard to actually uh, use that by itself because the uh, the combinatorial difficulty just gets bigger and bigger the further into your generating function you go. Uh, one thing I forgot to say yesterday, so this is maybe the first talk. One thing I forgot to say yesterday was that um, this also this also gives you a way of doing um, uh, of defining integrals on some kind of non-compact space. So before, I, you know, the, the way I think about doing integrals is I'm doing some kind of proper push forward in cohomology. If X is non-compact, it's no longer a proper push forward to a point. Uh, but as long as XT is compact, I mean, the fixed locus is compact, then I can still define, just using this Atiyabot localization, I can still define a map from, well, I guess I was doing everything in homology I'm doing. I could defan define a map like this after I tensor with this uh, fraction field. So, so to speak, if I, once I move to the, uh, the field of rational functions. And the idea is that after I tensor with the fraction field, this is the same as the equivariant homology of the fixed locus, and this is this is proper over a point, so it, I can push forward from here. So the result is this gives me a way of defining some kind of you know, integrals, but they're going to take values in the field of rational functions. Um, and this is, this is a good flexibility to have because almost any useful, any, most of the geometries where we can compute are going to be non-compact. Um, OK, so this was the first topic. And then the so second topic, which is where I'm going to continue now, was this idea of studying not just the Donaldson-Thomas theory of a threefold, but actually a pair threefold in the smooth surface. And so we talked about this uh, space of relative ideal sheaves. I have to be honest, I haven't really been looking backwards at my notes, so I feel like the notation has been changing. So I'm not sure if there are, sometimes maybe I put a comma here. I don't, anyways, I'm just going to throw up a bunch of letters and hopefully from context it'll be clear what I mean. Um, and so, okay, so this was some kind of space of relative sheaves, relative ideal sheaves. And the whole point of, these, of this space was that I'm only considering subschemes that meet this divisor D cleanly. And in order to compactify, I have to allow myself the option of not just considering sheaves on X, but sheaves on this kind of bubbled version of X. So this is the kind of object in this space. So, th so the motivation for this kind of object was to to, I mean, the, the original motivation has to do with some kind of degeneration formula, where I take a complicated threefold and I degenerate it to two simpler ones. But actually, that's not really how we're going to use it. Because, I mean, for us, x is going to be like p3. So it's not like you can degenerate p3 to anything really much simpler. Uh, the reason that this space is so nice is that it comes with some extra structure maps. So. So the first was this map to the Hilbert scheme of points on D itself. This was obtained by taking my subscheme and just intersecting it with the last copy of D. So if you like. And because of this condition that I'm 
intersecting this divisor cleanly, this is a sensible thing to do. Otherwise, I would need some kind of derived tensor product here. So this is the first nice map. And the reason why this is a nice map is that this is a smooth projective or quasi-projective variety, and we know everything about it. And we understand its cohomology very well. And the, the second structure map, so again, so an element of this space is a choice of target and then an, an ideal sheaf on it. So then the second structure map is this kind of weird one where I forget everything except for which target I'm on. And this takes values in this stack T, which is a stack of target degenerations. And as I explained at the end, one way, if you want to think about what the stack looks like, one way of thinking about it is, that, is there's actually an open substack of the stack of uh, three pointed gene zero uh, semi stable curves. And this is going to be a very useful fact because it means that, um, you know, anything that we can do using the cohomology of genus zero, of the moduli space of genus zero occurs, will give us some kind of, you know, structure here in this relative DT space. Um, so let me give the first example of this. So, th I mean, so this idea that you would translate, you know, the recursive structure of this moduli space into some kind of algebraic structure is really the center of studying quantum cohomology. And so all of, that, all of those same ideas translate into this setting. So this is some kind of application of this idea. So <coughs> it has to do with some kind of you know, version of the quantum ring. I'm going to fix some number n. I'm going to fix a smooth surface s. And I want to look at the threefold that is just s cross p1. And my relative divisor is going to be three fibers of this. So again, the, the way you can think about this is that so this, is, this is S, and this is the P1 direction. And I've singled out three of the fibers. So one, one thing I didn't say, I mean, strictly speaking, w w in this kind of definition of this space of relative ideal sheets, if D is disconnected, as it is here, here I have three things, I want to bubble them off independently. That, that's strictly speaking not part of the not the way I defined it yesterday, but I, I'd like to imagine each fiber here has its own set of bubbles. And so in particular, uh, uh, you know, this is b the space before I've done any bubbling. Uh, once I start bubbling it, if you look at it kind of, you know, vertically, it's, I get something S cross one of these kinds of curves. If that picture makes any sense. So are, are there any questions? OK, so, j so just like I did before, I can, I'm going to write down this space. And the curve class, well, I fix, I'm going to fix a curve class on my surface. And then I can get a curve class on my threefold just by taking This class on the surface plus you know this number of P1 fibers. Okay. <clears throat> and because I have these three relative divisors, I have three versions of this horizontal map up there. So I actually have for every for zero, one, and infinity. I have a map from this space. To the Hilbert scheme 
of s and the, the number of points in the Hilbert scheme is going to be the intersection of this curve class with this divisor and so by construction it's the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on s. Okay. So the goal now is to use this structure to, to construct something that and that very much analogous to the usual uh, quantum product. So I'm going to use these maps. These are going to be like just the evaluation maps when I do Gina zero gromov witten theory. So I'm going to pull them back and then, you know, integrate. So what do I do? So I fix three classes I in the cohomology of my Hilbert scheme. So maybe I can simplify my life by putting times 3 here. And I'm just going to put everything in this big generating function. So chi is going to be, again, the Euler characteristic. I'm going to sum over curve classes. This capital N is always going to be fixed, though. And then I sum, I take this relative dt invariant. with this insertion. So. Okay. So this is some huge thing. Which I'm going to abbreviate like that. Yes, I'll, write, I'll get there in a second, yeah. And I, I mean, I've, I'll be honest, I've, I've probably been a little sloppy about like the kind of degenerate term. But the claim, as Yang pointed out, yeah, so I, I, I can already tell I need to shift Q slightly to get this to be actually correct. But I, I can absorb it into, into the pairing. So the claim is that, um, If I choose the, if I change the inner product on the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme correctly, then these are actually going to be structure constants. Of a ring. Over Laurent series in these variables. Not only that, it's it'll be a deformation of the classical cohomology ring of the Hilbert scheme. Okay. And, and the proof of that, so. The proof of that is, is just identical to the proof in quantum cohomology, which is that the way, you, the way you can think about the argument in quantum cohomology is that I write down some relations, cohomology relations in the moduli space of genus zero curves, and then I pull them back to my space of stable maps. My virtual classes behave well with respect to splitting and things like that, and something that looks like associativity just falls out. Um, and so the same thing happens here. So same happens here. You know, the way you can think about it is that these spaces of relative maps, of relative she's, sorry, always carry maps to M03. If I take a fourth relative point, instead of taking three relative fibers, I take four of them, I'll get a map to M04, and then I can play around with that. So, you know, there's kind of, there are two rationally equivalent boundary classes and the cohomology of M04 and I pull them back and I get the associativity relation. Okay. 
So I'm not actually going to prove this. I just wanted to sketch the idea. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, all proofs are going to be sketches. Proofs. I mean, unless it gets really sketchy, and then I'll actually write down the word sketch. Um, so, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're just, you're just reading out my, uh, yeah, this is the next thing I'm going to say. Yeah, right, okay. So, so the natural question, which is that, okay, so what have I defined? I've defined a, a ring deformation of the classical cohomology ring. The number of variables is, so to speak, you know, curve classes on the surface plus one, which is actually also the number of curve classes on the Hilbert scheme of S. There's the curve classes on S plus one coming from well, this with the Hilbert Chow map, so maybe I can, I can say that. So, so B2 of the Hilbert scheme of S, assuming I have more than one point, is B2 of S plus 1. And that extra curve is the fiber of the, the map from the Hilbert scheme to the symmetric power of S. This is some singular object, and this is a resolution of singularities. And there's a, a unique curve class that's in the fiber of this map. And that gives me the extra one. So not only is this is a ring deformation, it's a ring deformation in the same number of variables as the, as the classical cohomology ring. And so you can just you know, naturally ask, you know, how does this relate? The usual quantum cohomology ring. Uh -huh. Question mark. So I'm, I'm about to lower this board. So if you have any questions about what's written here, now's your last chance. 